So my name is Marta. That's my Twitter and GitHub uh, handles. Um, I'm a software engineer, and I'm interested in DevOps, and I'm currently unemployed. So if you read the talk description talk, you might ask yourself the question, why do I? Why do me? Why, why does Marta hate fun? Well, I hope that when I finish, you will um, realize that I actually do not hate fun, just a very small subset of it. <laughs> so a couple months ago, I took part in a discussion about modifying uh, a user group's code of conduct. And the discussion was very long and very uh, difficult. And there were, there were different views, obviously. And one person um, who opposed any modifications to a code of conduct uh, presented an argument centered around free speech and quoted George Carl Carlin, an American uh, comedian, who ranted about um, a trend to soften language. And it got me thinking, why mention free speech and why mention uh, words of a comedian in this setting? After all, we're talking about a programming meetup. And I do think that it is important to be aware and to speak about um, how and, um, and culture influences our industry. And in such a context, talking about free speech might be important and might happen. But in that context, I think that wasn't the case. And I think that oftentimes, um, the, issue, the actual issue is that we tend to forget that we organize, participate in, host conferences, meetups, et cetera, um, first and foremost to share knowledge. And continuing on the subject of jokes, there is a trend um, to confuse conferences with stand-up comedy evenings. Do you, have you ever noticed that? I think that um, should I get a microphone, an extra microphone? So I think there's a, have you noticed this trend? I think I'm not the only person that has noticed that sometimes we really, I don't know, sometimes I'm confused when, I, when I'm at a, at a talk. I don't know if I'm at a programming conference or a, a stand-up. And it seems that we sometimes forget that um, sharing knowledge is what it's all about. And we started believing that the speaker needs to be exceptionally entertaining in the process of sharing knowledge with, with us. And I think this is connected with how we portray ourselves. Think about it um, for, a for a couple moments. Um, who are we? We are young, we are hip, we are edgy, and that's how we portray ourselves as an industry, as a community, as early adopters of new technologies. And it's also built in oppositions. We are not like those Java people. We are not like those micro Microsoft types in suits and ties, tucked in shirts with their corporate culture. Um, we're not like them. We are cool driven. We are innovation breathing. We are flannel bearing, we are rugged, coding rock stars. And we still see that in job advertisements, and we see that on conferences. And I'll be honest with you, seeing another hip, edgy guy on stage kind of makes me cringe. Um, it's not original, being edgy is not original. It be, being edgy nowadays isn't really edgy. When what, you, what edginess, we believe that edginess means being controversial, but what is edgy on stage is actually very mainstream. It's just perpetuating all the stereotypes and all the negative isms that we see every day. And it has nothing to do with originality. And furthermore, this being hip and cool means that we allow ourselves and encourage ourselves to engage and cherish behaviors that are not associated with corporate, corporate culture. And this has, obviously there are good things connected with it. For example, the fact that we don't have um, dress codes on conferences and that our events are generally more laid back. And this is good, but we still say or do things that would be frowned, up, frowned upon or found simply unacceptable in a corporate setting. And one of those things 
is cursing on stage. Now, I'm going to tell you something that you might funny or weird, but it actually happened. Um, last year, I had this conversation within a certain community um, where its prominent members, its kind of thought leaders, um, were known for repeated, repeatedly using heavy language on stage to a point where they kind of created a sort of peer pressure to do it. <laughs> it's kind of weird to believe that things like that happen in a group of adults, but it happens. And it's good to have a strong vocabulary for when you need to express strong emotions like amazement, anger, frustration. But first and foremost, there is a, um, there is a time and place for it. And secondly, some people really go over the top. And should we really do that on stage? So when you're standing on stage and you're cursing, for example, during your talk about Docker, it just makes you sound aggressive and will alienate you. People will not want to engage with you, especially if they disagree with you, because they will be scared. And it takes away from your message. People will focus on your tone, not, what you're trying, not on what you're trying to say. And it will make others reluctant to speak. So the modern computer showman with his strong language, strong opinions, invited to speak at conferences because he will attract an audience, a very homogenous audience. Um, he will help organizers fill their room, but the problems, problem is he will fill the room with people just like him. Then people who, who are just like him will get inspired to get into conference speaking, and we will perpetuate the vicious circle of white male ego dom in our industry. And that is going to make people like me just literally go crazy and leave. Over half of women in technology will leave technology sooner or later at, w at one point in their careers. Men do that twice. Um, women do that twice as often as men. And there's a plethora of reasons. And I guess that um, seeing everything, seeing Mm, the same kind of people on stage kind of adds to that. And if everyone on stage looks the same, that will be what we desire and what we perpetuate. We listen to people that look like, like those people on stage. We hire people that look like them. We design people for people that look like them, and we will ignore anyone who doesn't. And the thing is that being a speaker, has a lot of benefits. It's not only the financial stuff. Like, not often you will get paid, but sometimes you will. And even if you don't get paid, you will get a free conference ticket. You might get accommodation, and conference organizers might cover your travel costs. That's also financial benefit. But apart from all that, you gain recognition and respect in your community. You mingle with influential people on speakers' dinners and do not underestimate the value of that. You might, during your talk, while being on stage, you might casually drop a, by the way, I'm looking for work. And you will have tens or hundreds of people instantly registering that and remembering that. And it's hard to say how many jobs in our industry are filled um, outside of the official recruitment process, but I found some data that LinkedIn uh, collected based on their networks, and about a quarter of people in tech, um, in computer-related industry, will be hired um, thanks to networking. So who will get hired if the most visible people always look the same? So. A at a conference like Eurocamp, it might seem that I'm preaching to the choir, because Eurocamp is really different. Um, but not every conference is like that. And some of you might consider speaking, but might be scared and of a lot of things, or just a couple things. But how about we all just agree to try something different, just remind ourselves that more places can be like this place, and that we can do something um, if we consider speaking, or we can remind other speakers that there's a couple th rules that we, if we all follow, we could have a more diverse community. So the first thing is that we should all relax and realize that there's no need to show off. 
that if we are on stage, if a speaker is on stage, it means that <laughs> the audience will assume that there is a certain level of competence that got that speaker on the stage, and that's, a, that's enough. And despite what capitalism might tell you, exceptional is optional. Good is just perfect. It's, you don't have to excel all the time. That's not healthy. So we should realize then that fireworks, literal or um, symbolical, um, or having a chorus of singers humming your anthem behind you during your conference talk, or strong language and excessively strong opinions, they all aren't necessary for people to listen and to engage. And as I said earlier, they often have the opposite effect. And let's remember that even though all the con a lot of conferences in Europe and in the Americas are held in English, but that doesn't mean that every participant will be fluent in English and the English language, or that they will be fluent in English culture. So if your talk relies heavily on memes, on TV series, uh, on knowledge t of TV series, or obscure references to works of fiction, consider rethinking that, because maybe some people won't be able to follow. And I'm not saying to completely drop it, because I don't hate fun, but I've seen programming talks where it was all about applied memology, and I learned nothing from them. So my working title for this talk was You Don't Have to Be Funny to Be a Good Programmer, and I think funny is fun. I really don't hate fun, but fun is not a prerogative. And not everyone can be the master of laughter, not everyone has a sense of humor, and not everyone should be. It's perfectly okay. Like, it's truism, but we are all different. And in the end, people will want to learn about the topic of your talk, and everything else is optional glitter, except actual glitter. That should be mandatory. I'm not joking. <laughs> so simply try to be a good speaker, and there's a lot of um, resources on that, so I'm not going to... I reiterate them here, but if you want to sum it up in three points, it's to speak. You should just speak clearly, rehearse, and try not to get your your ego stand in the way between the audience and your message. And Katie Sierra, who you might, some of you might know as Serious Pony, has this great blog post about um, what not to do when presenting. And at one point in that blog post, she writes. The problem is thinking that what matters in your presentation is you. Because unless you're a paid performer, a musician, comedian, motivational speaker, you are not the reason that people came to the conference. And I couldn't agree more. I think that as long as we give in to the cult of heroes and showmanship, we will not have a healthy, thriving, and diverse community. Thank you. Great. Are there any questions for Mata? Yeah. Um, sure. Hi. Um, thanks Hi. for the talk. Um, it's, it's more like a comment, <laughs> not a question. Um, I totally agree um, when it comes to the written part, um, for example, in, in job offers. Um, I mean, you read things like, uh, yeah, we want to hire the best of the best, and um, everyone, I hope everyone uh, says that we want to get more women into tech, and we want to get more women into companies, and you probably um, don't, um, really don't get the women with um, these job offers. If you want to have women in tech, you probably just get rid of these silly um, job offers, of these um, yeah, uh, way of sayings. Um, but uh, I disagree, I mean, um, we all have our own opportunities, but I disagree when it comes to presentation or the, um, the spoken word, as I really like to be entertained on stage. But um, if, you, if it's just um, spoken, I mean, yeah, we're super awesome, we're <laughs> I, something like that. I like, to, um, I like to say things like that. But, it's always with a wink and, um, yeah, with a little bit ironic. And I think that's 
that's okay, and it's um, more meant like motivating other people. And um, I think it's okay when you can, when you're on stage and you can catch something with your self-confidence. And I rather like that. But I mean, I was entertained by your talk, and um, I wouldn't say that you are really showing off or bragging. And so, I mean, there are different ways of presentation. But I also like, I think I like entertaining kind of showmanship <laughs> presentations. Uh, thanks for your comment. Well, um, maybe I didn't make it uh, clear enough. I'm sorry that I don't think we should drop all of this. I think that we just have maybe this push, uh, this drive to, like I said, to be exceptional, that if we just don't deliver a good talk, that that's not enough, that we have to excel and make people remember our talks for the rest of their life. Uh, and the thing is that they will never, there, there is not a talk that you can give that people will remember for the rest of your lives. So we should just chill, maybe. Um. So you're talking about the relationship between the audience and the speaker. And I'm just interested to know, what do you think makes a good audience member? What makes a good audience member? Mm -hmm. um, well, if um, it assumes, hmm. well, I, sometimes I'm too nervous to look at my audience, uh, audience, but when I do, what makes me more nervous is when people sit with their phones, which I'm also guilty of doing when listening to speakers it means that I have, I can do two things at once, but it is kind of um, sometimes discouraging, but it's a small thing. I think that a good audience is in your talk, um, checking email, and maybe wait with checking emails for afterwards, and I guess that's about it. Any other questions, comments? If not, then another round of applause for Martha. Thank you.